2 Corinthians 3, 17, it says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. And that's what this next psalm is about. We just sang Amen, which there's various uses for it, but we always have Tim lead us in prayer. And when he doesn't lead us in prayer, when we're done, he always says, So be it. And so when we read Scripture and we say Amen or Amen, depending on where you're from, we are affirming what has been said, that it is true. Not only that it's true, but that it's, it's binding and it's true for us. And we are entering into agreement with that. So let's practice on this before we start this next song. When I say, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I am free. You will say, Amen. Let's do it one more time. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I am free. Amen. Amen.
Let's pray. Lord God, we're so grateful for that spirit of freedom. Lord, everything we are, everything we have, it's all from your hand. What a gracious God you are. Lord, we're so thankful that you care about each and every one of us, even in spite of our sin. Lord, we have fallen so far from you, but yet you pick us up, you care for us, you love us, you show us how to live. Lord, help us to listen to what you have to teach us today. Help us to focus on your word. Be with Nick as he brings the message. And guide our hearts that we might take your words to heart. And your words are, are food for our soul and our lives, Lord God. Your truth sustains us. So Lord, help us to focus on your word. To be attentive to what you have to teach us this morning. To set aside the things that entangle us. And to focus on you and what you care to show us. So Lord, we look to you now. Thank you for each other. Thank you for this time. Thank you for Nick as he brings a message. And Lord, we look to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning and God bless. Open up your Bibles, if you would, please, to 2 Kings chapter 5. We'll be looking at verses 15 through 19 this morning. And today's message is, remember... To say thank you. And I want to remember to say thank you. Um, I want to thank you, and I failed to do it last week, but I want to thank you for all the prayers and the thoughts that you have given uh, toward my family uh, during a time uh, with my dad. And so I want to thank you for that. They've been felt, I've felt the power of those prayers, and they are much appreciated. So thank you. We're going to continue to pick up with a message that we spoke about last week when we spoke of a man named Naaman, right? He was the commander of the Syrian army. And today we're going to find out just what exactly he did after he experienced a miracle of God and was cleansed of his leprosy, okay? Now, when I was a, a young man, I looked very forward to always going to my cousin's house because we had a routine. I would get out of the car, my cousins would meet me outside the car, and we would immediately run to the neighbor's house because when we would ring the doorbell, she would come and she would answer the door and she would give us orange push pops. <laughs> and we love orange push pops. And we would take the push pops and we'd gulp them down and we would get back to their house, and Aunt Kay would always be like, oh, I see you had orange push pops. The evidence was all over, right? She'd say, did you remember to say thank you? And we'd be like, uh... And we'd hightail it back over there and knock on the door again, and we would say, thank you. And I wish I could remember her name. I'll just say Mrs. Anderson. I don't know why, but I'll just say that. And she was the nicest lady, and she would always give us these push pops, and we so look forward to that. And so, we also have been the recipients of push pops from the Lord. Sweet treats, you know, spiritual push pops. <coughs> things like His kindness, things like His forgiveness, His mercy. How merciful is the Lord then to us. His compassion and His unending love. These are spiritual push pops, sweet treats that you and I can savor and that we can indulge in that the Lord has opened up to us. So let's read this passage of Scripture here today and see how Naaman remembers to say thank you to the Lord. And it reads like this. I'm in 2 Kings chapter 5, starting at verse 15. It says this. When he returned to the man of God with all his company and came and stood before him, he said, Behold now, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So please take a present from your servant now. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will take nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Naaman said, If not, 
Please let your servant at least be given two mule loads of earth. For your servant will no longer offer burnt offering, nor will he sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Rimmon, to go into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leans on my hand and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon. When I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. He said to him, go in peace. So he departed from him some distance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, let us be a people that always remember to come back to you and to say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, Psalm 104 says this. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. Psalm 103.2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Yes, folks, it is critical that you and I give thanks to the Lord to remember to stop and to turn and to give thanks to Him. Uh, before I go on, the slides that I post up here, they're always in black background with white letters. And I do that not because that's my character. I do that. <laughs> I do that because I think that that's the easiest to see. And so I hope that you can read all those words up there. But so anyway, uh, what we want to learn today is the biblical principle here is to give thanks to the Lord. Because giving thanks to the Lord leads us to worship and commitment to the Lord. And we're going to see that with Naaman here today. And so the questions that we can ask ourselves is this. Am I thanking the Lord and giving Him all the credit for the work He has done in my life? And am I taking for granted thanking the Lord. Now, these are questions that I asked myself upon studying this passage of Scripture, and I had to be very honest with myself. And yes, I was taking for granted the things God was doing in my life in a way that I was not going back and saying thank you. And I had been raised to say thank you to people. I had always been taught to say thank you for things that I had received. And there's been many instances where God has answered prayers in my life. And I have failed to go back to God to take special time and to thank Him for answering those prayers. I've been not just flippant or dismissive, but in some ways I feel that I have given credit to other people that didn't deserve the credit that they got when it was God who did all the work. And I think that we have the ability to do this, especially when we get a good diagnosis from a doctor. Let's say that you go to the doctor, right? And you have a condition that you're worried about, you're concerned about. So immediately you go to the Lord in prayer. Well, after some treatments from the doctor, your issue begins to dissolve. It goes away. And you start to think, wow, those doctors, they really did a great work. They really did a good job, and your family and your friends are visiting and calling you, and you're giving all the credit to the doctors, but we're not giving the credit where credit is due. And the credit is due to the Lord, because the Lord is sovereign over all. You know, you can get a diagnosis at one place and go to a different hospital and get a completely different diagnosis. And it's not because necessarily that the doctors were better there, but it's all because maybe there was a moment where you called out to the Lord and in that moment, God changed everything and he stirred the hearts and the minds of people in your favor. You could have had the favor right where you were at, but we didn't get the favor because we didn't call out to the Lord. And so when we call out to the Lord, doors and portals begin to open up. Things begin to happen that wouldn't have happened before. And we need to make sure that we stop and give God 
all the credit for that. And so this is something that hit home for me and that I really am trying to work on now in my spiritual journey with the Lord. Remembering to stop and give thanks. So let's go on and let's take a quickly look at the context of this passage of Scripture here today. Okay? And it's much the same. In fact, it's exactly the same as it was last week. Who is involved in this passage? And it is, or no, when is this taking place? I'm sorry. About 849 B.C., two years after Elijah is taken up to heaven, and about 80 years after the kingdom of Israel divides. Where is this taking place? Near the Jordan River, which is nearly 200 miles long and divides right down the center of Israel, right? And it runs north and south. Now, Samaria is where the prophet Elisha was, where Naaman went to from Damascus. And that's about 30 miles west of the Jordan River. And remember, he took that long journey, about 100 miles from Damascus to Samaria. Who is involved here? Naaman. Remember, we went through all his, his, his uh, resume last week, right? All the great characteristics that he had. For all of the great things that he had done, his identity was tied into him being a leper, right? And we talked about how no matter what we may tie our identity in, the mistakes we may have made, God sees you differently, right? And so what is happening here today? What's going on in this passage of scripture? Naaman returns to Samaria. After being cleansed, he went down to the Jordan River. He dipped himself in it seven times. He came back up a new man. His disease was cleared. No more leprosy, right? And so after this monumental moment, he now is making his way back to Samaria, to Elisha, to give thanks to him and the Lord for healing him of his leprosy. Why? Is this happening? And I believe there were three things here that immediately jumped out to me. One, to teach us that worship and commitment to the Lord begins with a thankful heart. Number one, a thankful heart. Number two, encourages us to return to the Lord, to thank Him, and to give Him all the credit for His work in our lives. Not some of the credit, but all the credit. And the third thing that I learned from this scripture is that we are to reaffirm that God, the God of Israel, is the one and only God. He is the true and living God. You know, being thankful has many benefits. Every study on the subject shows that a direct relationship links being thankful to better individual well-being. Your physical, your psychological well-being. It, being thankful reduces stress. You sleep better. You have less aggression. You have higher self-esteem and higher mental strength by being thankful. At the University of Miami, they studied two groups of people. They took ten people, and they had the first group of people of ten, group of ten, they had them write down every day something that they were thankful for. They had them journal something that they were thankful for. And then the other group of people, another ten group, group of ten, they had them write down things that aggravated them throughout the day. And they noticed that at the end of the study, those that wrote down the things they were thankful for had better mental health, less anxiety, less stress, lower blood pressure, they were able to sleep better at night. So there is therapeutic value in gratitude, saying thankful, having a thankful heart, and thinking back on these things and writing them down. Journaling is such a wonderful spiritual discipline and practice to get into. To be able to read a passage of Scripture and then to think about how that Scripture relates to your life and how God has worked in your life. You know, I believe that if you were to take the time 
you would be able to clearly see God would reveal to you the things He has done in your life. How He started you out in one place and brought you here today among this congregation to worship Jesus Christ. How did that happen? Where did that journey begin? What are some of the things that happened along the way? The nooks and the valleys, the peaks, you know, the heartbreaks, the good times, the joys. There's a lot that has happened to bring you here today. And if we were to take the time to remember that and to write that down, oh, how our faith would be made stronger. Oh, how we could see the works and the great works of the Lord. You know, that's exactly what the book of Psalms is. It's a journal from David's heart to the Lord. Oh, how I praise the Lord. Oh, how I give thanks to the Lord. Oh, how the Lord is my salvation. Where does that come from? How does a person begin to have these emotions and these feelings tied to a God that they cannot see? I physically cannot see this God. But how do I love him so much? How do I credit him so much? And it comes from a thankful heart. Without getting alone and thinking on the works of the Lord, our spiritual life is destined for spiritual decay. We simply cannot prosper our faith and grow in our relationship with the Lord without remembering to say thank you for the push pop. <laughs> we must go back. And so this is what Naaman does. And the first thing that we see here is that Naaman is ready to give his thanks to the Lord. Now I want you to go to verse 15 there. And I want you to take your pencil or your highlighter if you're on a Bible app. I want you to highlight this in yellow because this is going to show us how Naaman thanks the Lord. Verse 15, look what it says there. When he returned to the man of God. I want you to highlight that phrase there. He returned to the man of God. Why did he return? He returned to the man of God because his faith made him well. You know, all throughout the New Testament, we see instances where people put their faith in Jesus Christ. Remember the woman with the issue of blood. She so desperately wanted to just touch his garment, didn't she? If only, if only I can get close enough. You ever feel that way? If only I can get close enough to God, he will answer my prayer. Oh, he will hear my cry. If only I can touch him. She touched his garment. He said, who touched me? He said, woman, your faith has made you well. And that's what happened with Naaman here today. His faith made him well. But he had to stop. You know, we are a progressive society. It's go, 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 baby, all the time. What's the next thing? What's the next meal? What's the next plan? What's the next video? Right? I've done watched this, these 30 videos on YouTube. It's what's the next one? What's the next one? No, 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 no. We just can't get enough. We're always progressive. I mean, you look at it in our political culture as well. It's move forward, move on, right? Nothing's, it's not good enough the way that it is. What's the next thing? Okay? And this, the sinful human nature that we have is we have a habit of not stopping and appreciating the things that we have and of being content with what's in front of us. We want what's next. And we're fed this through the TV screen, the Apple iPhone 12, it's next. Well, they just came out with one two seconds ago. Now they've got a new one. And so we're being programmed like this. New cars coming out all the time. They're the same car, right? Same frame, built the same way they've been for a couple hundred years now or whatever, how long? But this one's got Wi-Fi. Oh, well, that changes everything. Let me just go out and spend an extra 10 grand on a Wi-Fi car, right? No. Well, you might, but I'm not. <laughs> right? So it's always moving on to the next thing. We are a progressive culture. But Naaman, here, he comes out of the Jordan River. He's been cleansed from his leprosy. And hallelujah. He says, you know what? I'm going to stop and I am going to return 
back to the Lord. You know, in our progressive society and with our progressive nature, if we continue to go forward, we're going to hit an iceberg. If only the Titanic could have stopped. How many lives could have been saved? Folks, we have got to stop. And you know what? I believe it's a good thing to take a few steps backward. Step back. Learn from history. Learn from our ancestors and our relatives. It's okay to do things the old way sometimes. In fact, the old way may have been a little bit better. Now, there's benefits to the new. We can do both, right? we got to have a little bit of the old mixed with a lot of some of the new and blend them together and move forward that way. But we've got to be able to learn from our mistakes. We've got to be able to look to the past and be thankful for what has been given to us. So Naaman went back. Look what Luke 17, 15 say. 17, 15, and 16 say this. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back glorifying God with a loud voice and fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Ooh, a Samaritan. A bloody Samaritan. The Samaritans and the Jews, they did not get along, did they? But there was a group of ten lepers. Jesus healed every single one of them. They left, they went on their way, and one of them, that's 10%, 10% came back to give thanks to the Lord. Now, I want you to be very honest and objective with yourself and ask yourself this question. Am I one of the 10%? It is of my belief, and this is a personal opinion, it may be right, it may be wrong, but I believe the church suffers from not going back and giving Thanks. I think we have our prayers answered. I think God is doing things right before our very eyes. And we are so focused on moving forward and ahead that we can't even see the work of God in our life. God has opened up opportunities. You know, I hear people getting new jobs. I hear babies are being born. You know, things are happening in life that is really really a blessing of God. Do we stop? Do we celebrate? Do we give the praise and the glory to Him? And that's what Naaman is teaching us today. He returned to the man of God. Now, something else that he did is that he went way out of his way to do it. Now, I told you, he started in Damascus and he came to Samaria, right? It's a hundred mile journey. So then he left Samaria to go to the Jordan River. There's 30 miles. So he's about a quarter of the way back to Damascus, back home. When he comes out of the Jordan River. Now, it would have been so much easier for him to just, you know what? This is good. Leprosy is gone. Glad I got rid of that. Glad I got rid of that. And just journey on home. Hey, I'm already 30 miles toward Damascus, right? I'm already a quarter of the way back home. Nearly a third of the way back home. But what did he do? He turned back around. He went out of his way. To return to the man of God and to thank God. You and I need to go out of our way to thank God. Now yesterday we went down to Somerset, Kentucky and we picked up a truck down there. Visited my mom. Okay? And we were journeying, journeying back north to Cincinnati. Well on the way back home I told my son and my nephew, you guys go ahead and you keep trucking north. Now I'm going to peel off here at Lexington and visit Dad in the hospital. So I get into Lexington and I stop at UK Hospital to see Dad. And so I give uh, my son and my nephew a call and I'm like, hey, where are you guys at? And so they text me their location. And I look at the map and I'm like, that ain't right. <laughs> and I look.
look at it and I zoom in on it, I'm like, they're on 64 West heading to Louisville. <laughs> so I'm like, this ain't right. <laughs> and my nephew's like, oops, we just not notice that. I was 64 East, back to 75 North and 275 West. And so they went way out of the way, right? They went way out of the way. Oh, but then they had to turn around and come back. And we want to go way out of our way, too, for the Lord. Look, I know stopping and trying to take time in our culture, in our lives, in our society today is a difficult thing. But coming before the throne, getting alone with God, and just saying, Lord, I want to thank you for answering the prayer of healing my father. I want to thank you for answering the prayer of healing my son. I want to thank you, Lord, for answering the prayer of bringing a new opportunity into my life. I want to give you the credit and I'm going to give you the glory right here and right now. And no one is going to steal your glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. Second Kings 5.15 says this. When he returned to the man of God with all his company and came and stood before him, he said, Behold, now I know there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Naaman knew that the Lord God of Israel was the one who answered his prayers. This is a man who come from Damascus in Syria. Damascus was infiltrated with many different cultures. There were many different gods that were being worshipped. We see here that his king, Naaman's king, was worshipping in the house of a god named Remen. Okay? So there were many opportunities, but there was something. Remember last week we said something about the God of of Israel because why would he take the word of that little girl that was in his house when she said my God can heal you the prophet of the one true God can heal you of your leprosy where he just took off and ran to Samaria well it was a journey but he went to Samaria he knew that he was dealing with the one true and living God and the God cured him of his leprosy cleaned him of his leprosy took it completely away, and the scripture says restored his skin fresh like a child. Not a blemish. You know, it's amazing too when I read into the Gospels and I see how Jesus healed people. There was a man who was lame, lame from birth, a man who was blind all his life. And when Jesus restores people, boy, he restores them as good as brand new. Immediately that man gets up and walks. He didn't have to get up and like, you know, figure things out and take baby steps. He, he got up and he walked like he had been walking his entire life. Blind men see like they've seen their entire lives. After Jesus spit mud and puts it on their eyeballs. This is a God that you and I serve that restores us as good as new. And I want to testify to you today that our spirit, my spirit has been made new and fresh and clean in my heart. And my perspective has been changed to a way that I never could have imagined. Never could we detail or think on our own how our lives could be so upended and changed. Through faith. We're on one track. And then we place our faith and trust in the Savior. And He changes it. Totally changes it. And this is what Naaman experienced down there in the waters. And it wasn't the water that cleansed him. It was the work of the Lord. After Naaman had returned with his thankful heart, he was ready to give the Lord his worship through devoted sacrifice and burnt offerings. Look here at verse 17, what it says here. We not only want to give the Lord our thanks, but by giving him our thanks, look what it leads to. There's a process here. 
We give him thanks, and then our hearts are ready to give him worship. Okay? There's a process. I want you to pay attention to the process here of Naaman. Verse 17, look what it says here. Naaman said, If not, please let your servant at least be given two mules loads of earth. For you, I want you to underline this. For your servant will no longer offer burnt offering, nor will he sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. What is happening here? <clears throat> he is showing commitment. And he is showing that he alone is going to worship the Lord. His thankful heart has brought him to a place of pure devotion to God and God alone. Commitment. This is the beginning of a beautiful relationship. Right? Now you know that the outpouring of love is fruitfulness. God said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Noah and his family, after the world was wiped clear, they got off the ark. Be fruitful and multiply, right? God has it in his plan for you and I to be fruitful and to multiply spiritually as well. And so that is what's going on here. Naaman, through this work of God, has come to a place where he is giving thanks to the Lord, and now his thankful heart has led him into a relationship, a committed, monogamous relationship with one true and living God. It's not going to be Rimen. It's not going to be any other God. It's going to be the one true and living God. What do we know about commitment? When you are committed to someone, you are committed to them alone. And if you've been married for any length of time, you know that that commitment means doing away with all flirtations, doing away with situations that could lead to temptations, right? And that's exactly what we see here with Naaman. You know what's interesting here? is that he asks for the dirt. Why would he want the dirt? You know, he went down into the Jordan River and he got cleansed in the water. Why did he want to take back vials of water? I asked myself this. I said, wouldn't it be easier for him to just get a jar of water and to take it with him? Hey, this is the water that I got cleansed in. Well, I want to let you know right now that the water had nothing to do with his cleansing. You know, when you get baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that water does nothing to you. Okay? That water won't clean your heart. It won't remove original sin. It won't wash off the stain of sin. The only thing that water does is serve as a picture of the commitment that you have given in your heart. It says, down with the old man, up with the new. It's basically like it's the commitment. It's the witness of the commitment. You are committing yourself to a spiritual commitment in Jesus Christ. Here you go. Here's your wedding ring right here getting dumped in the water. Your show of faith, right? But the water has no saving value. Same thing with Naaman. He went down into the Jordan River, and that water didn't cleanse him. That water didn't save him. So I thought about this. Why does he want the dirt? Well, it was a custom and a tradition back then to take dirt from one place to another. And I thought, well, maybe he wants to make an altar of it. And many commentators speculated on this as well. Maybe he wanted to take it back to a place and spread it out, right? And maybe he wanted to worship on that dirt. Maybe he just wanted to keep a memento. You ever keep a memento of something that the Lord has done in your life? I do. I have a softball at home when my car broke down and I poured it in there and I didn't know what to do. And, I was going, and there was a softball down by my foot. And that was God's way of speaking to me because he knows I love baseball. And it was just like, okay. And things started working out that got a tow truck, had just the right exact amount of money in my wallet um, at the time. And so, you know, I wrote those notes down. I have a, a softball there. And you have mementos as well. We go to the beach. We collect seashells. We 
take vials of sand and we bring them back home. God does things in our lives all the time and let us take mementos and fill our homes with those mementos so as a reminder to say, yep, I remember when God did that. Yep, I remember when God did that. Yep, I remember. Instead of getting out the photographs and sticking, you know, all these memories that we have, which is great and fine, by the way, but we can do that with the Lord too because He is a living being. He is the true and living God. He has done a magnificent work in your life. He has given you all that you have, all that you can do, the abilities that you have. You know, everything was made for Him, by Him, and through Him. And all things hold together in Him. Jesus Christ, the one true and living God, He alone deserves our glory and our credit. So He asks for this dirt, right? And I thought, why did He ask for the dirt? And then the answer came. He asked for the dirt because that's where the cleansing took place. How, you say? He went down to the water. No, he didn't. The cleansing took place when he made the decision right then and there that he was going to do what the Lord asked him to do. You see, the Lord had cleansed him already when he made the decision in his heart to follow the Lord. And it was just a formality from there on. You're going to go down the water and you're going to jump in. You're going to go down seven times. You're going to come up clean again. But the choice was made in the dirt. And you and I in our lives have choices to make in the dirt. In the dirt when it's hard. In the dirt where it's yucky. In the dirt where it's no fun. Where life is messy and things are That's where the choice is made to follow God. In the hard times. And Naaman teaches us that lesson here today. Make your decision to follow the Lord in the dirt. And keep the dirt. Remember those hard times. Remember those difficulties. And cherish them. You know, our culture and human nature teaches us to forget hard times. To forget difficulty. Put that behind you. You don't want to think about that. Put it behind you. No, 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 no. God says, savor it. Stay in the mud. Stay in the dirt. Call on the name of the Lord and see the salvation that I am going to bring you. Amen. He has got something good planned in the dirt. We always want to go to the clean place, to the good place, to the comfortable place. But it's in the dirt where God does his magnificent work. Because remember, he made us out of the dirt. You are a sanctified piece of dirt. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Don't you feel good about yourself? Glad I could bring that to you today. <laughs> Romans 12, 1 says this, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Yes, use your bodies to give praise and glory to the Lord. Psalm 77, 11, I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. Give the Lord credit for what he has done. So Naaman is thankful. And the Lord not only leads him to give worship, but the Lord also leads him to give his heart. Look what it says here. Naaman gives his heart to the Lord through a commitment. Psalm 22, 8 says this. Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. The Lord is a God who is seeking to bring reconciliation to us. And oh, how he has given us reconciliation. I want you to look at verse 18. Let's read that. It says this. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes in the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, my 
underline this right here. The Lord pardon your servant in this matter. The Lord pardon your servant in this matter. As captain of the army of Syria, Naaman had a duty to escort his king into the house of Rimmon. Okay, a false god. So imagine yourself as Naaman in his position. He's escorting his king into the house and the king is there to bow down and to worship to this false god. Well, as he bows down, Naaman also will bow down because the king is resting on his hand and he will bow down also. What Naaman is doing here is he is saying to Elisha, the prophet of God, the man of God, he's saying, when I do this, please don't look at it as a sign of me being unfaithful to God. Okay? This is just something that I have to do in order to appease my king. I have to go into this house, be by his side while he bows and he worships. But what I want you to pay more attention to is the feelings of his heart. He was concerned that the Lord would look upon this and not have favor on it. He was worried about how God would feel about him. Now, you remember what it was like to date? Because you don't feel like this now that you're married. But anyway, we should. And I'm just kidding. We do. <laughs> when you date, you're really concerned about how she feels about you, right? Or he feels about you. I mean, you want to impress, right? It's a new relationship here. Naaman has a new relationship, a committed relationship with God. God, I just want you to know... That even though I'm in this other God's house, there is nothing going on between us. Right? I am just here as a bystander. That's what he's doing here. He's saying, I want you to know that I'm doing this thing, but I give my complete commitment and devotion to you, Lord. He's concerned. Why is he concerned? Because he had a change of heart. His heart's been changed. Has your heart been changed? When you ask Jesus Christ to save you, remember that your heart changed and you had feelings about God that you didn't have before. And now you were ready to be committed to Him. You were ready to alone love Him and to cherish Him. Look what it says in Matthew 6, 12. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And I put that in there because this is Jesus Christ teaching about a heart of reconciliation. It is important for us to reconcile. You know, Jesus said, if you have a matter with your brother, before you come to the altar and worship, go and settle that matter with your brother. A heart of reconciliation is a true heart of change. Write a letter that person that you have a busted relationship with. Get it straightened out. Give your heart to the Lord. We see here through Naaman that through a thankful heart of gratitude, it leads him to true worship, it leads him to commitment, and it leads him to give his heart to the Lord. Yes, God has truly done wonderful things in our lives. And we have opportunity now to stop and to give him thanks for those things. Let us be a people who give genuine thanks to the Lord. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the mighty works that you have done in our lives. The greatest of which is the giving of your son, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, I would like to encourage anyone here today that has never tasted of your sweet salvation. Perhaps there's a heart here today that is ready to make a commitment to you. Father, I pray that they would ask Jesus Christ into their lives to acknowledge that he is the son of the living God, that he went to the cross suffered a death, was placed in a tomb, physically dead, and on the third day he rose again. <laughs> that he defeated death, he defeated
be your works of the devil. And that by placing their faith and their trust in Him, Lord, they will now inherit eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ. If you are here today and you've never made that commitment to the Lord, now's the time. Do it now. Ask Jesus to come into your life, to be your Lord and Savior. And you can share in eternal glory with Him, knowing that He has given you an identity and that you will be always safe with Him. Father, thank you for teaching us through Naaman how to commit and to sacrifice and to worship to you. Father, I pray here now for your blessings to pour out over this congregation. Father, I pray that your peace would extend deep into their hearts. And they would know, Father, that you have everything under your control. For you are the true living and mighty God. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.